Good morning, everybody, Good morning. and welcome. So before reading our acknowledgement of being on Abenaki lands, um, a few years ago, or a few years ago, a few weeks ago, Chris and I were down in Washington, D.C., and I had the opportunity to go to the Smithsonian Museum of the American Indian, which had displays from Alaska down to South America for uh, Native peoples. And it was pretty amazing, but one of the sections was on all of the treaties that were made and broken in succession. And it's just, it's a very emotional uh, museum to visit. And uh, anyway, but they also have very beautiful displays as well. Um, the It's a beautiful exterior, and they've got a nice waterfall on one corner of it. And there's a giant atrium up four stories. And then the displays are all, you can st take an elevator to the top and then come down looking at all of the displays. It's pretty amazing and I recommend it. I would like to acknowledge that the First Presbyterian Church of Barrie and many of our homes are located on the unceded and ancestral homes of the Abenaki people. We acknowledge that they are still here continuing to honor and bring light to their heritage, and we benefit every day from the theft of their land.
please join me in the call to worship. We gather in the presence of God who has searched us and known us. We gather in the presence of God who has known us and we sit down and we rise up. Who discerns our thoughts and our words before he may be dealt with. God hems us in and surrounds us. Everywhere we go, God is there. Secure in that knowledge, we gather in gratitude for the generous love and light of God. We gather this day to worship the one who is the source of our life. Our opening hymn is number 611. Friends, we come to this time with the assurance of God's never, ever, ever ending love, mercy, and forgiveness. And in that knowledge, we dare to join together now to pray our prayer of confession. Merciful God, we confess that there are times when we have sinned against you in thought, word, And what we have left undone. We have not always loved you with our whole heart and mind and strength. We have not always loved our neighbors as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been, help us amend what we are, direct what we shall be, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. In Jesus Christ we pray. Friends, hear the good news. When we are in Christ, we are new persons altogether. The old has passed away and the new has come. I tell you, in the name of Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. And let us... <laughs> Sorry, that one... We... <laughs> okay. I, I told her we usually announce the hymn before we sing it. But this one, I don't... I think we, we do. I'm so sorry. I think we got it. <laughs> Surprise! <laughs> i 
I don't recall whether you join me in the prayer for illumination or I just read it, so feel free to join in if you wish. Pour out your Holy Spirit, O God, and prepare our hearts to accept your word. Silence in us any voice but your own, that hearing we may also obey you through Jesus Christ. Amen. Our scripture reading is Jeremiah 18, 1 through 11. Jeremiah was a bullfrog. He was a good friend of mine. Oops, wrong chapter. God told Jeremiah, up on your feet, go to the potter's house. When you get there, I'll tell you what I have to say. Tell the people of Judah and citizens of Jerusalem my message. Danger. I'm taking doom against you, laying plans against you. Turn back from your doomed way of life. Straighten out your lives. The word of God. I've always loved working with clay. I remember my first experience with a clay-like substance was when I was a very young child. I got a box of Play-Doh Play for Christmas. And as I recall, the Play-Doh was created in cardboard cans with metal bottles and plastic bottles. And there were several colors, red, blue, yellow, and white, as I recall. The moment I opened the first verse, I breathed in, breathed that slightly salty aroma of the dough, and I was hungry. I wiled away countless hours fashioning tiny people and animals, creating villages and forests and fields, and more practical items like plaques and plates and cups that those little people were going to need. I could create a pot by using one color of Play-Doh or accent it with other bits of color from other cans, or I could create an entirely new color by mashing it all together. I was enamored of Play-Doh, and I had no idea at the time that this was actually a fabricated, commercialized copy of a naturally occurring substance. I could not, in my wildest dreams, imagine that there was anything on this earth better than Plato. <laughs> and then I went to kindergarten. And this is when I had my first opportunity to work with real clay. And there was nothing fake about this. It was the real deal. It was the clay that came right out of the earth, moistened and prepared by an unknown expert ready to be fashioned in the hands of this five-year-old into a priceless treasure. As I recall, the treasure that I created was a gift from my mother. It was a pinch pot. And I can remember making it like it was yesterday. I started by kneading the clay and forming a ball 
and then making a hole in the ball and stretching the clay, smoothing it out. And I remember meticulously applying a white base of glaze and then highlighting the rim and navy. And I painted little flowers on the inside, reds and greens. My mother used that little pot to hold her watch and her earrings at night. And she did that from the day I gave it to her till the last day she went into the hospital. So now fast forward several decades. When I was a youth pastor teaching confirmation classes, I rediscovered the power of clay as I was trying to come up with creative activities to help eighth graders articulate their faith, which it was a requirement in the church that I served. And I discovered quite by accident that all I had to do was put a lump of clay in front of every one of those kids on the table and tell them that when we're finished reading or finished doing whatever it was we were doing at that time, they could work with the clay. I had their undivided attention. They loved that clay as much as I did. And they would pretty much do whatever I asked them to do with it, including something as amorphous as creating an image of what you believe about God. I'm not sure why clay has such an allure, but I do know that it feels good to work with the clay. It's fun to wedge it. It's fun to knead it. It is fun to get your frustration out on it and get rid of all those air bubbles. You can pound it and it's all right with that. And once you get the hang of it and you get it under control, it can almost be soothing to work with it, to put it on the wheel, to keep it moistened. And after a while, you begin to bond with that lump of clay. It begins to take a shape and a form. And while you might have a basic idea of what you're trying to make with it, each lump of clay is different. And two pots are never exactly the same, even, even if they're created by the same design. In fact, I've heard potters say that when a lump of clay goes on a wheel, they even, even they cannot be 100% certain of what they're ultimately going to come out with. It takes on a life of its own. The potter is the instrument that helps the clay become what it's meant to be. And so it should come as no surprise that God the potter is an image that occurs here and there throughout the Bible. In fact, this image occurs in the very first story in Genesis. In the energy that the ancients identified as God, this, this God fashions human beings. The first human, as the story goes, named Adam or Adam from the clay, the Adama, the ground. So the name Adam is a play on word. Adam is the earth or the clay creature. Now, I have no idea if this God had fun fashioning this human creature, as much fun as we have with our clay creatures. But I'm betting the answer is yes, because the story goes that when these creatures were fashioned, God stood back and said, that's good, that's good. So that image of God as potter is one that would have been familiar to Jeremiah's audience, a community in which the potter played a vital role. Unlike today's potter who makes beautiful items that we often view as luxuries, the potter in Jeremiah's day created items that were necessities for day-to-day -day life. People depended on the potter's work and for cooking utensils, for things to, to eat from, for vessels to haul water. Each pot was made by hand and each pot was just as important as the last one. It was a precious commodity. 
A number of years ago, I got a sense of how important the potter was in the ancient world. When my husband and I visited uh, my daughter and her husband who were in Sicily at the time. And we had the opportunity to go to the ruins of a Greek city. This was a very, very old city. And what struck me about this ancient city was that there were probably half a dozen or more sites that were identified as potter's homes, pottery sites. So there was such a demand for pottery that it kept all these potters busy. So then to this morning's passage, the prophet Jeremiah is sent by this divine voice of God to observe the potter at work the potter that they might have on the one hand taken for granted and on the other hand, so depended on. This voice sends Jeremiah out just to sit and watch as this craftsman is creating these objects. Why? To receive a message. So the first message is go down to the potter's house and then I'll let you hear the message. Jeremiah has no clue what the message is going to be, but Jeremiah does what he's told. So he obeys and he goes to the potter's house and then the text says, I went down and there he was working at the wheel and the vessel he was making was spoiled in his hand and he worked it into, reworked it into another vessel as seemed good to him. And then the message of God came. Now it's interesting to me that Earlier, the message of God is in quotes, but later, this is not in quotes. So it's almost like not hearing literal words, but having an inner sense that this, there's a voice, there's an intuition, there's a knowing, there's an observation that Jeremiah interprets as divine from God. And the message that Jeremiah got from watching this potter work and rework the clay was the people of Israel, the people of his community were like clay in the hands of a divine potter. And if they failed to live according to divinely inspired laws, which means if they failed to respect one another, to live in ways that were good for the whole community, to live as though it weren't their own interests only that they cared about. If they didn't do that, they could be destroyed. Now, it seems to me that even though the words sounded like a threat at the end of the reading, that these words are less a threat than a warning that if people didn't pay attention to the way they lived, there would be consequences and they would not be good. They would be destructive to community and to self. But if they lived in ways that we could identify as God's laws or as principles for living together in harmony and community, then they would thrive. Everyone would thrive together. They needed each other. In observing the potter and the insight that came to Jeremiah, the insight that human beings are co-creators with God, that we are working together with this divine energy of light and love and spirit. That same message that came to Jeremiah comes to us today. It's made its way through all these centuries to us. And it's not a message that there is some God out there who dictates how our lives will turn out. And yet it's also actually a message that there is an energy that is moving among us and within us and that is intimately involved in our lives. This divine potter gives us the rule to live by. And it's a rule of love. Love of God, love of neighbor, love of self. And it's our job to work together to be shaped 
by that rule of love. So when we take that principle for living seriously and we live to the best of our ability, we naturally behave in ways that build up our community. We live in ways that provide sustenance for all. But if we're only acting on our own behalf, even when we're convinced of the rightness of our position without taking into account what's best for the whole, we travel a path that will lead to destruction. And one more thing, even when we're doing our level best to live with each other in ways that are best for all, things are not always going to go as planned. They're just not. We make mistakes. We disagree. Sometimes we work against each other wittingly or unwittingly. So for as much as we might try to design the perfect organization, community, family, relationship, there will be things that we didn't count on. There will be roadblocks. So here's a question. Will those barriers, those roadblocks, those disappointments, mistakes, losses, will those things, could those things actually push us into a space where we might come to a better outcome if we had been left to our own devices? Could the charred timbers of a burned out home be reshaped into a new dwelling that's sturdier? Could the shards of a shattered marriage lead to a fresh new life? Where are the broken places that bring us forth into something different, something new, something energetic and charged with vitality? Where are we being called to be potters? And what if we learn to view our lives, the stuff and the circumstances of our lives as individual and community as clay? And then not just reshape it, but also learn to listen to it. As Frederick Buechner said, listen to your life. What might we fashion together? In a few minutes, we are going to share this sacred meal. We come to this communion table. And as we do that, God speaks to us through this ordinary stuff of life, through harvest that grew in the soil and the clay. We have bread made from wheat and juice made from grapes. It's a meal that was created through a divine and human partnership, tended by the hands of human beings and fashioned into the ordinary substances that nourish us. As we share this symbolic meal, we have the opportunity to reflect on our own lives and examine the ways that we're working together with the divine potter. Amen. invite you now to stand as you are able um, and join in the hymn, Breathe on Me, Breath of God.
be seated. So we come to the time of sharing announcements and um, I am not sure what needs to be announced. So I yield to all of you. Are there announcements that need to be made besides the ones that appear in the bulletin? Seeing none, then we will um, move to the time of preparation for prayers. And I invite you now to raise any of your joys or concerns that we should be holding in prayer uh, this morning and throughout the week. Any prayer requests or concerns? I see nothing in the chat. Yes. Okay. Yes. So um, traveling mercies is such a wonderful term uh, for those who are traveling this weekend and coming back from longer trips. Any others? And let's be in a spirit of prayer. New every morning is your love, great God of light. And all day long, you are working for good in the world. As we gather this day, stir up in us a desire to serve you and to live peacefully with our neighbors and with all creation, devoting each day to you. And this morning we pray, especially for those who are traveling, we ask for safety on the journey, that they might come home to us. We pray for those whom we know are ill and ask for healing in whatever form it might come. We rejoice this day with those who rejoice for newness in their lives, whether it's a new relationship, a new life, a relief from fear of the possibility of bad news, which has turned to good news. And we pray for our broken world. We pray for peace. We pray for wisdom for our leaders. And we pray for strength and courage to do what we can to be part of the healing. And now in a few moments of silence, we offer up the prayers in our hearts that are so deep that they can scarcely be put into words. We offer our prayers in the name of the one who taught us that when we pray, we should say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, earth as it is heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debts. Lead us out of the Deliver us from evil.
And so friends, now we come to the table and I invite you to this joyful feast of the people of God. All are invited. The scripture goes that they shall come from north and south and east and west and gather at table in the sure and certain knowledge that Christ invites all to come and partake of this feast that he has prepared. And so let us be in the spirit of prayer. Before all that is, you were God. Outside all we know, you are God. After all is finished, you will be God. Archangels sound the trumpets, angels teach us their songs, saints pull us into your presence. You beyond the galaxies, you under the ocean, you inside the leaves, you pouring down the rain, you opening the flowers, you feeding the insects, you giving us your image, you carrying us through the waters, you holding us in the night, your smile on Sarah and Abraham, your hand with Moses and Miriam, your words through Deborah and Jeremiah. You lived as Jesus among us, healing, teaching, dying, rising, inviting us to your feast. And so we pray, O oh God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us. Enliven this bread, awaken this body, for us out for each other, 
Transfigure our minds, ignite your church, nourish the life of the earth. Make us while many unite us, united. Make us, though broken, whole. Make us, despite death, alive. And may these ordinary elements of bread and juice become the divine body and blood of Christ for us. You, holy God, you, holy one, you, holy three, praise now, praise tomorrow, praise forever. Amen. So friends, the story goes that on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and after giving thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body given for you. Whenever you eat of it, remember me. And in the same way after supper, he took the cup and he said, this is a new covenant poured out for you. Whenever you drink of it, remember me. And so friends, take and eat, take and drink. Let us pray. Holy One, we give you thanks for the way that we have been fed in body and spirit through these holy elements and through this gathering in which we support one another and come together. We give you thanks that you are our life, our mercy, our might our table, our food, our server, our rainbow, our ark, our dove, our sovereign, our water, our wine. You are our light, our treasure, our tree, our way, truth, and life. Praise now, praise tomorrow, praise forever. Amen. Now I invite you as you're able to stand and sing our closing hymn called as partners in Christ's service. Mm
Now, friends, may the peace of Christ be with you wherever it may send you. May it guide you through the wilderness, protect you in the storm. May it bring you home rejoicing at the wonders it has shown you. May it bring you home rejoicing once again into our doors. Let's go in peace. Amen. In honor of Labor Day, the postlude, you'll recognize the tune, but the words are, are different, so I'll just read you. <laughs> this is uh, Solidarity Forever, um, um, sung by Pete Seeger, among others. So I'll just give you an idea. When the union's inspiration through the workers' blood shall run, there can be no power greater anywhere beneath the sun. Yet what force on earth is weaker than the feeble strength of one, but the union makes us strong. Solidarity forever, solidarity forever, solidarity forever for the union makes us strong. And there's even, is there aught we hold in common? Well, I was thinking because of the communion thing, but anyway, but you get the gist of it. So, but you'll recognize it too.